Jewish, um, some of the most successful ones, this is going back to about 1860, 1870, this is many, even, even before we were born, Chucky. Uh, and uh, so, <laughs> but, uh, you, you, you know, and a hit, a hit was, was how many sheet copies of sheet music you sold. But, uh, you know, look, um, I don't want to make this a Jewish thing or an Israeli thing or anything, but, you know, we're in Israel and a lot of us are Jewish here. One thing that Jews do very well, I mean, you don't see them on the baseball field or on the basketball field. Uh, in the old days, they were good boxers, but then they got tired of getting the crap beat out of them. But uh, we are great songwriters, and, and it started back back then. And uh, that's why I don't understand, well, I do understand why, uh, but uh, why Israel isn't more important in, in the music business. And I think, I hope I don't get arrested, I think that your government, you know, doesn't regard pop music to any great degree. They, you know, they, they bow down at the classics and all of that and jazz and all of that. They should pay more attention to what's going on here. You know, Israel won the Eurovision contest this year. Do you know how hard it is for Europe? You know, we got a lot of people that don't, don't like Israel to win the Eurovision contest. Even people, I'm sure, who like that song the most wouldn't even dream of voting, you know, for an is Israeli song. Um, and uh, I hope I'm not talking out of line here, but uh, look, Israel should have one of the best music industries, you know, for its size and even greater than its size in the world. And I tell you, it, you got to get on your government to, to do something about it. It's, it's a god awful shame. What do you, what, do you want to pause for claps? <laughs> as a, as a um, music aficionado and expert in the field, what would the government per se, what are some practical steps that the government could take, do you think, to raise should, the spotlight on They should music? realize what the hell is going on. That's all they have to do and act on it. There's, I mean, I mean, first of all, uh, aside from helping it, the people, there's money to be made here. You know, I mean, if, you know, look, the, the export of music, you know, the, a lot of that, it, some of that money would come back to Israel. But, um, you know, it would certainly go in the pockets of all of, all of these, you know, artists and, and songwriters who, for the most part, I guess, are Israeli citizens. Yeah. It's a long, hard battle with the governments everywhere. In Australia, we've been fighting our government for about 40 years. At the moment, we're going through a huge fight over uh, the domination of uh, Spotify playlists that are programmed and placed in America so that Australian bands are battling to get into the top 10 of their own singles charts because Spotify playlists full of American music are dominating our charts. It happened in England about 18 months ago, the English made it all change and now the English acts are getting back to the top of the charts. We live a long way away. We sort of, you, you're closer but you are cut off because of being Jewish and as, as I thought Seymour summed it up pretty well. But we've had to fight and uh, we're fighting Spotify. We're fighting getting us enough Australian music on the radio and uh, when the radio allocation of Australian music went up, the radio station started playing old shit from 40 years ago, not new stuff. So we're fighting it. The, the government, the money the government puts into sending our acts overseas is a pittance. We're fighting that. In Canada, they collect millions of dollars off all the radio stations. They pay, this organisation called Factor, pay for the... Canadian young acts to make records. They give them money to tour around the world and they support their music. And you're not alone. You've, you're a long way behind a lot of us, but you've got to stand up and you've got to start telling these idiots in government. We've been lucky in the last four to 10 years where some of the senators in, in, have grown up in music and are actually being supportive for the first time. But. As Seymour said, you've just got to get out there and fight for it. 
it's it's a bit easier now that you can make your own record. You can uh, put it out on Spotify and Apple. You can uh, get into the social world and start getting it onto different posts and different social areas and you can start to build it yourself. Uh, you just need to make sure that it's registered with the local Performing Rights Society. Right. So no prick rip, rip, rips your song off and releases it as theirs in America or the UK or Russia or wherever. But you can do it, you can start to do it yourself. And in the last 18 years, the amount of Australian bands that are now blowing up all around the world and bringing millions and millions of dollars back into our country, a lot of it's come down to somebody sitting in a fucking office at four o'clock in the morning in New York or London, playing with the internet and going, fuck me, where did this music come from? And away it goes, and that's what it's all about. Well, Canada has content laws too, so there needs to be a certain number of Canadian songs that are played on the radio, and I don't think that exists in a lot of different places where that... Well, there's small percentages. I don't know about here because well, it's well, well, such a... It, it doesn't, you don't have to... There may be a certain... I'm sorry, I mean, there is no place outside of Canada where you have to play a certain amount of Canadian records. Yeah. I mean, and they, they do well all over the world because their government is behind them. Right. And I, 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 I mean, I'm just not challenging you. But I don't think the Australian government is against music, I mean, no, at all. No, but here, not. here, they don't give a damn about pop music. They really don't. I don't, I don't see it. Mm. But uh, I've, I've never, it's, it's... It is a shame. It's different, yeah. it isn't di it's different than anywhere else in the world what, that um, I know of. Yeah, no, and, but, um, again, not to move off the topic, but you did sign Ofer Haza, which, you know. I did. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that experience and, it, and where's it, the next one, you know, it, where's the it, next it version? It wound up being a very sad, wonderful experience while it lasted, but it didn't last very long because, uh, you know, uh, she had a horrible husband and he infected her and she died very, very young. And, um, but she was one of the greatest talents I ever came across, and I, I do believe that, uh, and she was, she had it all, she was so beautiful, uh, I mean, and, and so talented. It was, it, it, it was so tragic the way she died. It was really tragic. Um, it was so, so sad, she was such a talent. You were, when you were, um, to backtrack a little bit, when you were 15, you went to intern as a summer intern for Sid Nathan in Cincinnati yeah. for King Records. And I don't know if internships then are the same as they are today, but how valuable an experience was that for you? And is that something you might encourage well, if people here find their own version of Sydney? I had, I, I had many, many uh, people who I learned from. Some of the very best, the, the, the people from Atlantic Records, Ahmed Erdogan and Jerry Wexler and Ahmed's brother Nessui and a guy called George Goldner who really helped usher, usher in a type of rock and roll called doo-wop, if you know what doo-wop is. Uh, and I had many, but of all of them, Sid Nathan was the most important. And uh, my book is dedicated to him, and I owe him, I owe a lot of people a lot, but him the most. Um, if you can find somebody to take you under their wing, um, it would be great. But I think that most of you people at, I, 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 I could be wrong, but uh, are artists, and you're looking, that, that's a whole different thing. What you have to do as an artist is never stop believing in yourself, never stop working, never get you, get, you get discouraged, but don't let that, you know, poison you and, and, and stop creating and everything, because sometimes it takes a, a very long time to make it, you know, and, um, you know, especially, the younger you are, the, the slower the time passes, so it seems longer, you know. Um, but um, I, oh, I'm not. I'm sorry. I was moving the thing around. Um, but um, I, I think just never stop believing in yourself. Keep going, and um, you know, if, if you got it, you know. I think talent will out in the end. <laughs> She said, tell it, Seymour. Oh. <laughs> and uh, Michael, how about you? When you were young and through the ages, what were, who were some impressionable uh, 
some mentors that made a great impression upon you and kind of helped get you going in the industry? Um, there were a lot of old style Australian promoters that I used to go to the local dances in Tasmania and I'd stalked the promoter from Melbourne and watched how he operated and everything. And then I, when I moved to Melbourne, I was lucky enough to get a job as the poster boy in an agency uh, where I was able to watch all these people work. And uh, I met a lot of artists who took me under their wing and I started tour managing bands. And then in 1972, uh, one of the biggest promoters in Australia, a guy called Paul Dainty, who still operates today, took me on as tour director and I started working with bands like Status Quo, Rory Gallagher, um, Robin Trower, Bob Marley and then I, I became the tour director and we brought out huge stadium shows with ABBA who broke out of Australia and so working and spending three weeks, Fleetwood Mac, Linda Ronstadt, so many big acts in the 70s, spending three to four weeks with those acts, working for two or three months setting up the tour, then touring with them. You, I just learned so, so, so much. And so that was an amazing period of my time. And then in 1979, I, I was in an agency with a very uh, a comparable Jewish gentleman called Michael Gadinsky. We started Frontier Touring. And uh, we, as Seymour, broke a lot of the English uh, new wave punk bands of the 79, 78, 80 era. Gadinsky got all their publishing for Australia. So we toured The Police, Reckless Eric, Squeeze, Elvis Costello. So we started Frontier Touring and we started touring all those acts. So again, we were there at the right time and we've been lucky that that still continues. And, you know, my motto during that time, and don't worry, I got a few t tour t-shirts that cost me a million bucks, don't worry about that. And I wear them with pride. But during that time, my motto, and my motto still is, if you believe in yourself, you believe in something that you're doing, just keep banging your fucking head against the wall because the fucking wall will fall down. Okay? I love it. <laughs> now, Michael, it's kind of a fun question, but Bell and Sebastian wrote a song about you. How, what is that like, and do you like the song? They wrote about me. They wrote about, about you. Oh, they wrote about yeah, you. No. That's right. Nobody's bothered about to write Seymour. about me. I'll write you. Seymour. Wrote one it was there, a Bell and Sebastian. It's a Bell and Sebastian song about you. What is that like? Pardon do, me. Do you like the song? Well, it's, I mean, it's a very sad song. I mean, <laughs> but um, it, it, it um, I, I found the band. I wanted to sign them, and then I got to know them. And I loved them. I mean, they, they were just... But I, I didn't... At the time, Sire Records was in partnership with Elektra Records, and the woman running it was quite a tough woman. She's a great music lady, uh, Sylvia Rohn. And I, I figured, my God, um, I'll get one shot with this band and then just say, Seymour, what are you, crazy? You know? Um, it, with this, you know, and uh, I didn't want to uh, subject them to, to any of that, and uh, I didn't sign them for what I thought was their own good, and uh, you know, so I, uh, I I told them I had to rush back to New York, and I even changed my flight so I couldn't leave Scotland a day early, yeah. and all of that, and they wrote this beautiful song about me. Uh, they went on, they signed with a, you know, a, 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 and they, they had uh, some success. Um, I think they should have had more success. They were very, very special. Do any of you people know about Balancy? They're very, yeah, very, great. very good, very, very good group. So, um, cool. but I, I did it for what I thought was their own good. And, uh, you know, I st still hear from them very occasionally, but, um, you know. What are, um, I mean, today's music, music industry is so vastly different than it was even, you know, five or ten years ago. What are some of the challenges, I'll, I'll start with, um, I'll start with Michael in terms of promoting younger acts coming up through the ranks today. I mean, records aren't selling the way they used to. Now it's, people are downloading just individual tracks. So what are some of the challenges that, that, you, uh, that you face when promoting acts? 
Well, I think, you know, the, the industry changed so much so quickly that it's been a big learning curve. And one thing I will say to everybody here, I mean, you don't close your mind in this business. I've been in this business 55 years. I've seen a lot of changes. But I keep learning new shit every day. I learned some stuff off a couple of young musos last night. So you continue to learn. I mean, the, one of the challenges for me was that I had mainly, I got out of artist management at about 1983. I fell in love with my second wife, wanted to have kids and get married, so I stopped managing acts. I got back into managing and recording acts about five years ago. And um, one of the challenging things was to learn about all the new income streams. And don't let anybody tell you there's no money in records anymore. There's a fucking lot of money in the records. You've that just... It's bullshit. Yeah. It's bullshit. I manage a young Australian band called Shepherd who had a billion streams worldwide. Uh, had a monstrous hit four years ago called Geronimo, uh, which is still continuing to sell around the world. It recently went double platinum in America. They have a song now which is nominated for Song of the Year in the Australian Awards in three weeks' time. They've sold out a tour of Europe in December. We had a, a sink in uh, Holland during the World Cup uh, with a, our hit, current hit called Coming Home. And uh, it was played on, on every World Cup game and every World Cup preview and review show on Holland's like BBC television national network. Uh, it was the number one airplay song in Holland for six weeks. It's still top five in the airplay charts two and a half months later. Last week we got a neighbouring rights check, which is a, from Cobalt, our publisher, who were on an admin deal with, by the way. You never sign away your rights to your publishing. I'll just slip that one in. Seymour might. <laughs> Seymour's not a publisher, so I can get away with that one. Um, and we got a check last week for one quarter, and it was 75,000 British pounds. It's pretty, you know, and then we've got a song in Early Man, the cartoon movie, and we had a song in The Chipmunks, and those songs bought in 100,000 US each. Those sinks bought in 100,000 US each. You start to add that up. In August, they were song, they had four songs on. Fox Sports in America, they were Artists of the Month and I'm sitting there watching the PGA Championship, which ends, they cross to the American Women's Champions Golf Championship, Worldwide Live TV and they play one of the Shepherd songs for two minutes. The money you get for that is incredible. So the income streams, the live royalties, the, the, the performing rights royalties, there's so many different income streams. And that's been the big challenge and how to get to people and how to manage the socials so that you don't get flipped out of the way by Facebook and their fucking algorithms and all that. And, you know, YouTube came to us and said we love the band and they, they put them into this new Google Music thing they've got where they created their own YouTube channel. So all of a sudden the subscribers went from 220,000 to 390,000 worldwide. So you just, it's managing all that assets and the money's there and you can pretty much do it yourself because as I said before, somewhere someone will hear a song and away you go. So, I mean, Seymour, do you have anything to add to that in terms of how has the advent I of social... I couldn't add anything. He said it all. He said it all. But, <laughs> but the only thing, the Sorry, only, the, only, the only thing I would say is, look, it hasn't just happened in the last five or ten years. The business has been changing all the time. I mean, I think it's been kind of dramatic the last 15 or 20 years. But, the, look, music is a mirror of the times. Um, and uh, it should be changing. And it is changing. Just keep on top of it. But uh, first, first get into it, you know. Um, and just do it with all your heart. You know, jump in, the water's fine, okay? You've signed some um, really incredible acts throughout your, um, your tenure. And a couple, when I was reading your book, a couple of things stood out. Your, um, when you sort of, uh, when you signed Ice-T, I mean, he, he didn't know of you, from you, and you kind of did something 
unconventionally cool in that office when he agreed to sign with you? I don't, I don't know if it was cool or not. Well, he but, thought it was. Well, he did, and, and that's what led him to sign. It was, it was just, it was totally spontaneous. Um, I mean, can I go back a little before, yes. I, a, a few months before I found Ice-T? I woke up one morning and there was some rap records, you know, uh, on, playing on the radio. And I said, you know, I said, my God, you've totally missed out here. You don't have any, you know, any of these acts. Um, and I felt 